the climate justice movement gives me more hope than I think anything I've seen uh, politically since the end of apartheid and since the struggle that South Africans led for free access to AIDS medicines. I think those two struggles gave me a sense that even when things look bad and, and the adverse balance of forces is a, is a formidable uh, depressant for us to be active, uh, people still struggle on and it doesn't take more than a few really committed people to change the balance of forces. Now we aren't going to change the balance of forces on the climate at the global scale because of the structures and those are these countries and the World Bank and the other big institutions, the big corporations coming into Copenhagen to Cancun and to Durban where I live with an agenda of business as usual and each one of them goes to negotiate for the ability to do more to pollute. Uh, for each of the countries it's about how much more of the carbon space can they occupy before it runs out. For the World Bank it's how much can they finance and commodify nature. And that means because the structure is so uh, adverse at the global scale, we have to do a lot more locally and nationally to change that. Uh, right now we, we can't have any false illusions that the UN FCCC is going to make the changes needed to save the planet. That's been more than clear. So what are people doing that's making an impact? If I look around the world I see such extraordinary courageous activism that's direct action oriented. Uh, civil disobedience is common and it's really about as the Ecuadorans put it in their slogan from Acción Ecológica and Conai, it's leave the oil in the soil and the coal in the hole and of course the tar sand in the land and there's going to be one for keeping the shale gas in whatever it's going to be. <laughs> and th those are the sort of slogans that really epitomize a well thought out uh, clear statement of political strategy which is if fossil fuels are going to wreck our planet just like at the Montreal Protocol for Chlorofluorocarbons in 1987 we have to cap them and we have to do that uh, individually where uh, there are particular points, emissions sources that are very dangerous. So for example the coal in West Virginia and those mountain tops were being blown up so that the big companies could strip out the coal and destroy in the process the entire ecosystem. Well that seems to have been halted by strong activism. The activists would sit up in the trees but they'd also protest at the US Environmental Protection Agency and then uh, in, in January of 2011 the EPA said, okay, we've got to, using the Clean Water Act, stop the mountaintop uh, blasting to get uh, at that coal. Another good example is um, in the Niger Delta in, in Nigeria where there's huge amounts of oil and uh, with Ken Sarawiwa's tradition of mass nonviolent civil disobedience, women especially took up the struggle. They would sometimes take off their clothes and sit down en masse in front of the entrances to Chevron and Shell and all these other companies and just not let the workers come in and that was really taboo for those workers to try to cross that kind of a picket line and they've succeeded and along with the group the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta starting out again not in my backyard don't let this oil extraction wreck our Niger Delta and it's much worse than the BP disasters happening all the time but then they started kidnapping foreign oil workers and, that, and blowing up some of the pipelines and that was a very militant and violent approach to but you know in that sense they also were part of an argument that said keeping the oil in the soil um, in the sense of the Niger Delta to protect the, the people and the environment there. Some of the most brilliant Niger Delta activists like Nemo Bassi, the head of Friends of the Earth International who in 2010 won the Right Livelihood Award uh, and he's been saying this isn't just about NIMBY, not in my backyard, it's about the planet and its hygiene and that means we're going to keep the oil in the soil for the sake of the planet. The Yasuni Park in Ecuador is one of the next sites of struggle where we have to watch very carefully because the activists in Konai, the indigenous people and Acción Ecológica, they're saying look there's 10 billion dollars of oil in the Yasuni in the Ecuadorian Amazon. We've got to keep it there and keep the integrity of, of that society intact. But we also have to demand that the climate debt that countries like Canada owe to the Amazon and to the third world and to the victims of climate change that that should be paid and one way is to keep the oil in the soil by paying about five billion dollars through all the northern countries Germany and Norway have been approached. Now the big debate is should that money flow directly then into Ecuador and then allow that oil to be left there and to support indigenous people in uh, their ways of life and to support a sort of development that isn't hydrocarbon based or should it be put up into the carbon markets and part and parcel of the old problem of commodifying everything. That's a battle still underway and those activists in Acción Ecológica and Conai are really there to be watched. But all over the world these are the kinds of struggles when you see Australian kids in rising tides stopping 
the huge coal exports from Newcastle and dinghies, you know, blocking the, the Chinese ships from getting access, or the Brits, they were doing such a good job that MI5 tried to infiltrate them. And the guy that did that uh, was actually a victim of the Stockholm Syndrome, and he was uh, compelled to uh, actually not testify against the, the activists who'd blocked one of the big uh, oil uh, refineries there. And all over the third world, we're finding really impressive sites of, of struggle where um, climate justice activists and environmentalists and communities and local labor, where they have a, a really good sense of what a just transition will mean, are working together. That'll come together in a place like Durban with a big alternative summit where we'll have a strong unity call that says, keep the oil in the soil and leave the coal in the hole and the tar sand in the land. And I'm hoping that that will, in turn, allow us to move from the, the protest sites to, uh, of, of a big sort of uh, um, gathering against the International Convention Center in Durban, and maybe even go to the beach, a going away party for the beach, and then maybe even going to direct action. The big question is, will the governments like Canada send uh, delegates, uh, and, and the d officials and the politicians who come to these things invariably will sabotage it. Canada, especially because of its role in the Kyoto Protocol, dropping out. And that means that the question that many in South Africa will ask to Canadians, should those delegates actually come to Durban where they'll simply make it a conference of polluters? Or will we be able to ask Canadians and South Africans and all of the world's people to work together to ensure that the kind of people doing climate deals are those that are really committed to the planet, not to continuing the emissions. And that's going to be the struggle to get internationalism as strong as possible. We've seen that happen before with Canadians fighting apartheid, Canadians supporting the uh, activists getting free antiretroviral medicines for AIDS, the Canadians who have worked with us for many years against water privatization, especially at the Council of Canadians. So I have a very good feeling that working together, Canadians and all of the rest of the activists will make Durban really unforgettable.